<laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, episode four. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, and as always, we appreciate your support on episodes one, two, and three so far. This was a really fun episode, wasn't it, AJ? Yeah, I learned a lot. I asked a lot of good questions. This, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we had an episode that we just recorded, um, and it really it, it's it really goes with the covering all topics um, description of our podcast. We we love our Moto fans, and I know AJ loves his Moto fans, um, but this is our attempt to delve into uh, a completely unrelated realm. Something that we're going to try to do from time to time. Um, to get a, a really broad uh, reaching um, topic base. So with it, we had a guest on, her name is Lindsay Butler. She is soon to be PhD. Um, and we'll get into her bio when we uh, launch this. But uh, it was a really fun conversation. And I encourage everybody to, to listen to the entire thing. Very pertinent discussion. Um, it was very informative. I learned a lot. AJ had a lot of great questions and we learned a lot. <laughs> um, so I'm a good yeah. question asker. No, I, I think that having her on and I was a little intimidated, I think, especially just for episode four, like it, it seemed as though we kind of jumped right into something that was way above my head. Um, we, went, we went deep. We went deep right, right. away. For sure. <laughs> but I think that's the entire purpose of this podcast, which I think will be fun to kind of delve into in the future. And the kind of the point of it too is to make it easy and understand, like, so everyone can understand. Um, yeah, break it down. And I, I hope, break it. yeah. So hopefully we did that. Um, I'm, I'm definitely pumped with how it came out. As soon as we release that, I'm going to listen to it back just so I can try to get more information back from it. So. Hope you guys enjoy. And uh, yeah, I mean, it is covering all topics. So it's not just going to be dirt bikes. It's going to be a little bit of everything, which uh, which I think is very awesome. Yeah, and I think Lindsay was a perfect first guest. Um, she's extremely well-spoken, very articulate. It sounded like she's done this a million times. Um, and hey, listen, I think this is what our plan is going to be, right? We're going to do... Especially when the Supercross season starts, we're going to have uh, a weekly recap, a Supercross for Dummies type of deal on on the Mondays or Tuesdays after the races, and then we're going to get into another episode right. later in the week that's gonna that's gonna bring in um, you name it, right? So we're gonna we're gonna really try to get a broad um, topic base for everybody, right? And, so and I, break I think it that down. would be our but, flow too. Is is we'll have uh more of especially once supercross season starts we'll have a moto specific race recap type um almost like my racer x article um but more of like a open discussion on that and then we'll have another podcast uh, a couple of days later that'll be covering whatever the heck we we feel like covering Exactly. And we didn't get to any questions this week. Uh, that has been our theme the last three episodes. We didn't get to it because this conversation ran a little long and we wanted to devote as much attention to it as we thought we needed to. So while we didn't get to any questions this week, we still encourage everybody to go to questions.catpodcast at gmail.com. Submit those questions. And even if you have any suggestions for guests you would want to hear on, or if you have any, any interesting people that you'd want to hear from, or you yourself might be an interesting person and want to contribute to our program and be a guest on our show, let us know. Questions.catpodcast at gmail.com. Yes, sir. Send those questions in, sit back, relax, and learn. Yes, sir. Enjoy, everybody. Our guest for episode four is Lindsay Butler. Lindsay is a PhD candidate in the Department of Environmental Health at Boston University. And Lindsay focuses on the prenatal and environmental epidemiology and examines how climate change impacts the health of vulnerable populations. Lindsay has a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Science from Simmons College and a Master of Science in Environmental Health from Boston University. Lindsay is a recipient of the Boston University Initiative on Cities Early Stage Urban Research Award. She serves on the boards of the Boston University Medical School Climate Group, the Boston University School of Public Health Doctoral Student Organization, and 500 Women Science Scientists Boston.
Her dissertation examines how heat and air pollution impact the health of pregnant women and the developing fetus. Welcome, Lindsay. Thank you so much for being our third guest. Second guest. Thank, <laughs> thank you guys so much for having me. Well, that bio is extraordinarily impressive, and <laughs> I'm really looking forward to, to chatting with you. Lindsay is a very, very good friend of mine and is one of the brightest individuals I know. Um, so I'm really looking forward to this conversation, and it's, it's a, a topic that's super relevant, very pertinent, especially right now, um, and is extraordinarily important. So thank you again for, for doing this. Of course. I'm always happy to speak to the general public about our work, um, but hopefully I don't bore your highly specialized motocross audience too much. <laughs> no, that's I the goal of this podcast is to, is to make it as widespread as we can. So it is called covering all topics, <clears throat> but you know, you have a good bio if, if Bryce can't read it. If, if, it's, <laughs> <laughs> if it's messing Bryce up, then it's got to be impressive. It, it's 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 a wordy one and uh yeah my resume is very very short in comparison but it's it's awesome and and i'm very very glad that i get to call you a close friend um so let's let's start because we are we're trying to make a lot of topics available to audiences who might not necessarily either go out and um try to get that information themselves or might not have access to it bring a a, a a lot of important stuff to, to people who might not get it otherwise. So let's let's start here. What do you do? <laughs> and we could start with maybe even what is epidemiology? Sure. So um, epidemiology is definitely not a word that's uh, understood uh, by the general public very often. I get questions from, do I study spiders? Do I study the epidermis? Do I study all kinds of stuff? Um, the epidermis but, being skin, for those of you who don't know. Yes, yes. But epidemiology, um, quite simply, is the study of diseases. Um, who is getting sick? Where are people getting sick? When are they getting sick? Why are they getting sick? The word actually comes from Greek and translates uh, from, it means that which falls upon the people. The study of that which falls upon the people. Um, and so that's that's pretty much what I do. I study um, what is going to befall the people so that we can try to uh, remove those risks uh, for a healthier general population. And as an epidemiologist, there are many subspecialties that you can study. So there is cancer epidemiology, there is pharmacoepidemiology, so studying causes of cancer, studying the effects of different um, pharmacological and drug agents, uh, their social epidemiology. So I sort of sit at the um, interface of two different subspecialties of epidemiology. So my background prior to getting into epidemiology was as an environmental scientist. So as an environmental epidemiologist, I study um, how the environment, both the built and natural environments that we live in, impact the, our health. And then as a prenatal epidemiologist or a reproductive epidemiologist, I study how our environments impact pregnancy, uh, reproductive development, things related to fertility and, and adverse pregnancy outcomes. So I, yeah, that's, that's pretty much what I do. I use a certain set of statistical tools uh, to try to characterize who exactly is getting sick so that we can remove sick. Now, what made you choose those two specifically? Well, I've always been super um, interested in environmental sustainability and environmental science. Even from the time I was a young young kid, my mom jokes about how in preschool she would go through my backpack and just find all this garbage um, or garbage, <laughs> as she would say in her Boston accent. Um, but it was actually things that I thought should be recycled. <laughs> And they didn't have recycling at my preschool, so I would take like juice oh, boxes wow. and stuff out of the trash <laughs> and bring That's them home. Cute. Um, so I don't know. I've really been into environmental sustainability um, and just sort of how we treat our environment from a really early age. And after college, I started working for an environmental firm. And one of the things that I think is challenging for idealists in 
who study environmental science and then go into environmental consulting or that type of work is that oftentimes you're actually working for the polluter um, to keep them in compliance with really inadequate environmental laws. And so I was working in environmental consulting. I became really concerned about the lack of knowledge about how the different chemicals that I was seeing impact different groups like pregnant women or children. And then at the same time, um, a very good friend of Bryce and I's became sick with cancer. And I think those two things happening in parallel, like my discomfort with what I was seeing in the environmental field and the way humans treat the environment in parallel with our friend getting sick um, with a cancer that was attributed to unknown environmental causes made me sort of see this cycle where we mistreat the environment and the environment in turn mistreats us. And it's a really nasty cycle. And so I decided that um, I just didn't want to be in that field anymore. And so I uh, came to the BU School of Public Health to try to get some skills so that I could better understand the relationships between humans and the environment and improve those relationships. You know, this AJ, AJ could could uh, attest to this. This is something that's near and dear to my heart as well. And and as you both know, I work in the environmental field. As a matter of fact, I work for a competitor of of the agency that um, Lindsay had worked prior to joining the PhD program. So I I can speak firsthand to exactly what you just said. And um, it, this is such an important topic that is so underrepresented in the general public because i think one of the biggest problems right now is we everybody hears climate change everybody hears epa but it's always under the cloud of some political agenda or it's under it's under the cloud of this tribe versus that tribe and it's not it nobody takes the care that is really this this topic deserves to to challenge themselves intellectually to understand what is coming out of, I mean, a factory or any industrial um, process and how it can affect human beings. And so I think this is, in my opinion, what you're doing, Lindsay, is, is one of the most important jobs in the world today. Um, especially with respect to how we are going to make it as a population. I mean, forget climate change and flooding and all that for now. Just with all of the different things that we're now discovering are linked to cancer, that are directly causing cancer, that have such a negative impact on human beings. Well, that's where my head goes. Right. So me being the dumbed down version of this conversation, what – like when you when you guys bring that up my my first thing goes at least for me maybe it's just getting older and seeing and knowing more and more people that are getting cancer you can't help but wonder what the heck is causing all of it do your studies like go as far as like researching you know would cell phones and computers and stuff like that count as environmental or man made or or do you not go that far because as we sit here and talk mm -hmm. on our phones, I can't help but think that's got to be one of the one of the reasons. Yeah, so um, those types of exposures are definitely some of the things that are included in my field. Um, we have one study of fertility that is happening at BU that asks, like, how often is the male partner keeping his cell phone in his pocket? And, and not to suggest that there's very strong evidence that that could reduce your sperm count or anything, but because people do have these concerns about that, we want to really see if we can quantify that and get to the bottom of it. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's there's exposures all around us. There's our cell phones, there's computers, there's chemical products. And I think what's really challenging and, and to speak to Bryce saying, you know, why isn't more of the public discourse um, around, why isn't there more public discourse around this as we see is, is warranted for this problem? And, I think it's because there's this like comfortable complacency where people think that we are being kept safer than we are. So, for example, 
there's about 80,000 chemicals in consumer production. Um, and there's the chemicals that are in our carpets, that are in the couches that we're sitting on. There's flame retardant chemicals and, and there's all sorts of materials, so like 80,000 plus chemicals in production. We know the human toxicity of maybe 600 of those. And I think that's very, that number is very alarming to people who just have this assumption that EPA and the FDA have characterized the things that we're exposed to every day, that they wouldn't let us be exposed to them otherwise. And that's not the case. Here in the United States, the impetus to prove that something is dangerous lies on the scientists who study these compounds. Whereas um, in comparison in the European Union with their chemical um, legislation in the EU called REACH, the, the impetus is on the, um, on the uh, producer of the compound, the manufacturer, to prove that it's safe. So you can see how there's this uh, preferable. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I think what what's compounding that problem is the need for innovation for companies. You 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 can never keep up with the different compounds that are that are being created um, for for any number of of consumer consumables. Um, and and AJ, just to kind of give you an idea, there. What what Lindsay was talking about about toxicity levels, there chemicals are there's what's called the permissible exposure limit, and it's essentially a measure of how much of a chemical you can be exposed to for a certain length of time, where you would either um, get an acute response, negative response, or an acute chronic, or I'm sorry, or a chronic response, meaning. How long would you have to be exposed um, to it to get a, a response that appears immediately? And how long and for how, uh, what frequency you'd have to be exposed to that chemical um, to see a chronic long term effect? So here's an example if you have an acid and you get acid spilled on you, that exposure limit is very low because you're going to see an acute response, you're going right. to burn your skin. But okay. something like um, a polychlorinated biphenol, PCB, that could take many years to manifest into a cancer. Um, so, and, and that's, this, that's this is chronic. a field that I... Now, what's that? The other one's acute and that one is what? <clears throat> that would be chronic. So a, an exposure that you're exposed to for a prolonged period of time um, that you're in constant contact with, it might not necessarily be a high amount, a low dose. Um, but when you use your example of radiation as a cell phone, now not to say that I don't have any evidence to suggest that it would or wouldn't cause anything. So I'm not going to go there, but that would be an example of a chronic exposure. You're, it's a low right. dose of, of radiation or whatever you suspect for a prolonged period of time that would, that would induce something like a cancer. Now, when you're studying that, Lindsay, how, how long? Like, what's the time period? You know, a lot of people say, well, it's too early to tell with cell phones. Maybe we'll know 10 years down the road. Mm -hmm. How long are you studying this for before, like, you would actually have a pretty cemented answer on, on what's what? Well, Lindsay, before you go there, why don't you, why don't you kind of specify what, what you're specifically looking at um, as, as far as your studies go? Like, you, you, have, you have two main areas of, of concern, correct? In my own research? Correct, yeah. So um, my research in, um, so my dissertation looks at the impact of extreme temperatures and air pollution on adverse pregnancy outcomes. So there's a few motivating factors for why we want to look at this. So first of all, we are experiencing unprecedented extreme temperatures and heat waves especially are going to become more frequent, they're gonna become longer, and they are going to uh, occur in areas of the world that we never had problems with extreme heat before. That's a really big problem from a health perspective because it's very different for someone who grew up in Southern Florida to experience you know, four consecutive days over 95 degrees than someone who grew up in Boston and currently lives in Boston. And that's because 
number one, in Florida, it's more common place to have access to air conditioning. Pretty much everyone has air conditioning and the housing stock is built to let heat escape. And those people who have been living in those regions are used to heat. Their bodies are more acclimated to heat exposure. In places like Boston, where we're going to be experiencing more increased heat as a result of climate change, you have an issue with our housing stock where our historical housing stock was built to track heat in and protect us from the winter time. And not a lot of people have access to air conditioning up here in Boston. And in addition to that, our bodies aren't acclimated to that kind of heat exposure. Um, and then just overall, like I said, we're going to be experiencing more extreme temperatures. So with this exposure increasing, we wanna make sure we're prepared for all of the ways that could uh, impact heat, uh, impact health, excuse me. So, then, from a, so from a public health standpoint, where you might step in would be to develop a proposal to um, increase air conditioning availability in, in an urban environment, so to speak, is that is that a fair? Yeah, so Goal of yours? That, that would be ideal, but one problem with air conditioning that we've seen is it's a little bit culturally nuanced. So one group that we know is vulnerable to heat exposure is the elderly. Um, and there have been programs in New York where like they offered a AC unit and a window AC unit. They offered um, incentives to help people with their energy bills in the summertime but people still were not taking advantage of the air conditioning. So air conditioning might not be the best solution. And then also another thing with air conditioning is we need to reduce our energy usage and air conditioners require energy. We would like to see more large scale ways that cities can reduce heat exposure for their citizens. So is that more green space? Is it more parks? Is it living roofs, green roofs, white roofs, blue roofs? Um, is it painting pavement white um, to help increase the albedo effect? Uh, uh, so those are all the kinds of things that our research explores. The second motivator um, for why I study the impact of these things on pregnancy is because- Hey, Liz, just get a little a... bit closer to the mic so, we, so it's crystal clear for us. Sure, is that's that better? Per that's perfect. Um, so, there is a very small scientific literature that suggests that there is an increase in adverse pregnancy outcomes in the summer during uh, in warmer climates and an increase in adverse pregnancy outcomes in the winter in colder climates. So for example, there's one study really? out of Brisbane, Australia that has found there's an increase in the amount of preterm births in the summertime. And there's another study out of Uppsala, Sweden, that shows that in the wintertime, they see um, more preterm births. So yes, and when I say things like adverse pregnancy outcomes, uh, that could mean a lot of things. It could be small for gestational age or decreased birth weight. But my work looks at um, preeclampsia, which is pregnancy-induced high blood pressure in the mom or um, uh, stillbirth or preterm birth. And what would that be a function of? So we have a couple hypotheses. So my one flaw of my study design is that I'm looking at the effects of the acute exposure. So I want to know if your exposure to uh, extreme temperature or particulate matter, which we can talk more about what particulate matter actually is, or ozone, um, which is something another air pollutant that we're concerned about, if exposure to those in the in the windows right prior to having the adverse event it is what triggered it. So if if you experienced really bad air pollution during like your third week of your pregnancy and that put you on a negative trajectory with your pregnancy, my work doesn't capture that. My work only looks at the acute effect. Um, and so when you think about those acute effects, it could be a variety of things. It could be uh, dehydration in the mom, it could be physical stress, it could be um, that she has, she's not sleeping well. Um, there's a lot of different, could be changes in air pressure, um, it could be oxidative stress from air pollution. So there's a few different hypotheses that we have in terms of that mechanism. 
That's really strange. And, and um, I'm curious. This really sparks my curiosity because there's a lot of research that would suggest that heat and extreme heat and extreme cold are beneficial for a human being um, because you produce heat shock proteins and cold shock proteins in either one of those extremes. So it's it's strange and counterintuitive to hear that it could possibly be adverse for a pregnant woman because you a think really of like the benefits. Amounts, though. Correct. I, I think yeah. I think those are produced like in. That's why when they say you you do like a contrast shower or something like that, it's you know, 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off. I don't think it's meant to be months at a time or, or days at a time. Right. Well, the sauna, they're, they're doing like pretty prolonged sauna exposure, you know, 20 minutes, four, five times a day at like 120 degrees. So, yeah, I mean, so that would be really dangerous for pregnant women. And that's because physiologically, they can't thermoregulate very well. Um, if you ask, and it's funny when I, when I um, talk to anyone who's been pregnant in the summertime or is pregnant in the summertime and they hear about my work, they're like, oh my God, I'm so glad somebody is studying that because it's really unbearable um, because so much of their blood is being directed towards the placenta and the fetus that they don't have as much physiologic sort of capability to actually cool themselves. Um, so yeah, they can't physiologically right. thermoregulate. And then another uh, motivation for this is that, okay, you have some populations or subsets of the population, which we know we have to be really worried about in a heat wave. And that generally includes the elderly, um, both for their physiologic challenges and because they're oftentimes socially isolated. It also includes asthmatics, you know, increase in temperature can lead to increase in air pollutant concentrations, which could be dangerous for asthmatics. And then very young children who say don't know to drink more water on a really hot day and maintain their hydration. And also because of their body size, they're more uh, physiologically vulnerable to heat stress. So those are the groups that we always would designate as a sensitive population in a heat wave. So what would happen in that case is that uh, additional public health resources may be directed to that population, or at least their clinicians are aware of the fact that they're vulnerable. The problem with pregnant women is they're, they're never included in that designation. And if we just use some common sense here and we see, well, they can't really thermoregulate, so why wouldn't we include them? in that sensitive group that should get a designation in the heat wave. All right, that makes sense. Now, do you think you would be hypersensitive to, I, I assume, do you have kids or you don't have kids yet? I don't have kids, no. Is that in the plan in the, in the future? Yes. Um, <laughs> now, do, would you be hypersensitive to some of these things or you know, being pregnant or going through that yourself, what would be certain things that you would really avoid or, or focus on <laughs> or every good question? So, I get asked this question a lot and it's not just in regard to pregnancy, but just like since you've started studying, you know, I've been at it now for about six years studying why people get sick, studying pollution uh, and its role in why people get sick. And so people are like, okay, well, since you've started studying those things, what do you think you should avoid in your everyday life? And that's a really Everything. hard question to answer because, you know, we got to go outside. We got to get our exercise. We, you know, we, we are go we're going to encounter the impacts of climate change in our everyday lives. And we're going to encounter plasticizers in our foods. And um, I have a few things. Um, Try to drink plenty of water. Try to do things that are going to increase your metabolism because that's going to get these things out of your body faster. So drinking a lot of water, getting enough exercise, getting some sleep, just maintaining your overall health can be helpful. Um, and then there's a few obvious ones. Um, you know, if there is a air pollution warning like the ones that we're seeing in California right now that say it's very unhealthy to go outdoors, stay indoors. 
Um, another one in terms of your chemical exposures is plastics. Don't microwave your food in plastic containers because the plastics, the plasticizing agents will leach into your food. Um, and then I, I'll actually say in this, this piece of advice definitely differs by what part of the country you're in. Since I started studying drinking water contaminants, I actually feel more comfortable drinking from the tap than less comfortable. <laughs> but that's because I live in Boston and we have some of the cleanest uh, tap water in the world. <laughs> that was going to be my next uh, question, actually, was you, you, you yeah. say drink a lot of water. Um, I'm a little bit of a freak about the caveat, what type of water I drink. The caveat, the caveat there is that your water is not contaminated with anything. Right. Now, do you avoid bottled water with plastic bottles? I try. So I, um, a lot of the water that I drink, I use glass bottles or I have um, some like metal, like swell bottles that I try to drink out of. Um, but the thing about drinking bottled water, so there's a few things with bottled water. One, single use plastics are obviously bad for the environment. I mean, even we're recycling them, but still, it's you know, it would be better if we're using reusable uh, containers. Right. Then, secondly, um, if if you leave your um, plastic water bottle in the sun, say, or in the hot car, again, plasticizing agents are going to leach into your water, and some of those um, plasticizing agents can be endocrine disruptors, which means that they uh, mimic hormones in our body and throw off our hormone systems, our thyroid system. And then lastly, so when your drinking water um, leaves your municipal water supply, so whether that's in Boston or Glastonbury, it's being tested for certain agents and there's a long list of things it's being tested for. And um, with bottled water, it's actually um, regulated less closely than the water that's coming out of your tap. Because it's regulated by the FDA as opposed to municipal quality assurance? Yes. So that's, yeah, I mean, that's, that's wild. The water, the water thing and the plastic thing are, are two of the scariest things for me because they're so ubiquitous. We come in contact with them every single day. I mean, what's the stats for, for plastic water bottles? Something like a million are, are thrown away every second or something like that. Like it's staggering. And it kills me when I like go to conferences and stuff and there's like, Aquafina, I'm like, can we get that out of here? <laughs> well, Aquafina is one of those ones that isn't. It's it's like a. It's basically tap water. I mean, they're just. <laughs> it's not a spring water. It's just you might as well just put your bottle underneath your sink, and that's it's going to be better for you, like 100. percent But the the I mean, you touched on the 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 plastics being endocrine disruptors, and BPA is is probably the most well known of those. But even some of like the BPA. Uh, substitutes now are being shown to uh, be endocrine disruptors. So the alternative to the harmful chemical, there's no research to suggest or not enough research to suggest that those are even safe. And what I think is very interesting, especially with the, the BPA, is that they're not just seeing, um, you know, I think one of the most well-known causes for BPA leaching is heating of that, like microwaving it, um, heating up of a, of a water bottle in a microwave or whatever, or in a Tupperware or wherever you find a plastic in contact with a consumable. But now they're seeing that just the reusing of those water bottles, just reusing a Poland spring water bottle could potentially be leaching whatever harmful agent into the next bottle of water. Right. So that's, that's, that's pretty scary. They, they do degrade over time. And I'm really glad that you brought up BPA because I think it's a really interesting case study of a consumer chemical for a variety of reasons. One is that, uh, so one of my colleagues did a study looking at BPA exposure and she compared people who, um, she had some people in her study who were having, it was like a double blinded study where some people were having canned soups in those cans would be lined with BPA. And then some people were having homemade soups and then they would cross over and they looked at their BPA levels in urine over time. And they found that it was the people who were 
when when the people were drink, uh, eating the canned soup, excuse me, um, they had higher levels of BPA in their urine. And some skeptics of that study said, yeah, well, BPA is it's half-life in the body, which means how long it stays in the body before it's excreted in our urine or whatever um, is, is super short. So we're just going to pee it out and it's not a big deal. But that's not the case with BPA because the exposure is so ubiquitous. It's in so many of our consumer products, we all have so much exposure to it that while we are peeing out that dose that day, we're being exposed again the next day. So BPA is pretty much consistently in our bodies. And so you're being you just said, chronically exposed to it. Exactly. And like you said, with the um, so with BPA, it's a really good example of consumer outcry. You know, it, it wasn't scientific study. Well, there were scientific studies that that um, informed the consumers about the threat of BPA, but it wasn't really science and policy that was that got BPA out of products. It wasn't the EPA coming forward and saying, we're going to take the steps to remove BPA. It was consumer outcry. It was angry moms who didn't want to see BPA in their kids' baby bottles. And so consumer outcry worked and a lot of manufacturers willingly removed BPA from their products. But when you uh, replace an agent, with something that has an almost identical chemical structure that is made to do the exact same thing, maybe with a little bit of common sense, we could conjecture that it's also going to do the same thing to the human body, which is right. you know, an endocrine disruption. And so that's an example of how replacement can sometimes just fly under the radar. And now we just have a very similar chemical that's doing the exact same thing even after the success of consumer outcry. Oh, and BPA is one of those ones that is such a good example because it's it's now turned into a marketing piece of lingo, right? BPA right. free. That right. it's and it's it's very misleading. Right. It's it's what we would call greenwashing. Um, you know, using this type of marketing even though what you're doing is not beneficial to human health or the environment. Now, is it true that BPA has been linked to breast cancer and heart disease and stuff like that, or? I think the strongest evidence with BPA is that it's an endocrine disruptor and endocrine disrupting compounds um, have been linked to breast cancer, AJ. So what happens with BPA is the chemical compound, so the structure of it is very similar to, um, to estrogen, and so it sort of will mimic the things in the body that estrogen would do in like a normally functioning body. And so that can lead to all sorts of things. It can throw off the, a mom's um, hormonal function during pregnancy, which can have bad implications for the fetus. Hormone disruption um, can lead to different cancers. Um, so yeah, just this the fact that it's disrupting hormone systems is really the thing that we have the strongest evidence for at this point. Okay. Now I'm reading here too, early puberty. So that would make sense too, right? So for girls mm -hmm. entering puberty, um, it says studies show at this age has fallen by more than a year with only one generation. That's pretty scary. Yeah, which is really striking. And that has long-term impacts on women. Um, age at onset of puberty where menarche has been uh, linked to increased risk of breast cancer later on in life and, and other things. So these things, a lot of what I study has to do with a hypothesis called DOHAD, um, which is basically looking at the developmental origins of adult diseases. So how does BPA exposure in a young girl lead to things that might happen to her later in life? Or how does lead exposure to the developing fetus lead to the <clears throat> risk of Alzheimer's later in life? And then you can see just the innate challenges of studying these things. Like I can't enroll a kid who, you know, I can't enroll a, a four-year-old right now and know that I'm going to be around to follow them up um, when they're 80 and we start seeing Alzheimer's studies. So it's, it's really a challenge when you have these chronic um, exposures that have developmental origins to disease. You know, and this is just one of the 85,000 plus chemicals that right. Lindsay that's what mentioned I'm, before. That's what I'm thinking and as you guys talk you know, about another this. One, another one that I, that I think of that nobody knows about, 
that I, for whatever reason, I kind of got obsessed with at one point is titanium dioxide. And <laughs> titanium dioxide, AJ, is a food coloring that they use to make things white, among other things. But they, it's a food additive, most notably, that makes things white. Um, I One of the things that it's in very commonly is Sour Patch Watermelon. So anybody out there who likes sucking <laughs> on Sour Patch Watermelons, you're ingesting titanium dioxide. Like but I guarantee you the next time you look, Sour Patch? Yeah, yeah, like the Sour Patch Kid Watermelon. Ooh, that's my favorite <laughs> right? one too. Yeah. <clears throat> yep. So, and, and the next time you get anyone out there picks up a, a food level and, and finds titanium dioxide, take a look. It'll be in there. Um, what, what's, what's crazy with titanium dioxide is that everyone knows how bad asbestos is, right? And asbestos has a crystalline structure that's very, very hard and rigid. When it, you inhale it, it creates micro lacerations in your lungs, and that leads to uh, cancer mesothelioma. Titanium dioxide has a very similar structure to asbestos, but it is sharper. So it is it, titanium dioxide creates micro lacerations inside your body that God only knows what what the implications of 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 that could be down the line for someone who's ingesting something that would be that you would not even think of on day to day, but it's just another example of little things that are poorly studied, poorly understood, and maybe no research at all on what the long-term effect of this kind of stuff is. Mm -hmm. I think that um, that's really interesting. So one thing to keep in mind with this is that the root of exposure is very important. So as dangerous as asbestos is via inhalation, and we know that inhalation of asbestos leads to mesothelioma, the um, ingestion of asbestos fibers. So there have been um, some inst instances where uh, asbestos contaminated the inside of a drinking water pipe and then populations were exposed to a lot of asbestos and, and nothing happened. So it's important to remember that the root of exposure from all these compounds has huge implications for the way it impacts our health. Um, and then I also wanted to say about how you said, you know, the structure of titanium dioxide and this idea of creating these micro lacerations is similar to asbestos. And, you know, we are very serious about the way we treat asbestos in this country is that we don't, one of the problems I think with our environmental laws and just this sort of lack of common sense is that we don't just like take what we've learned from other chemicals and apply it to new exposures. And I think a really good example of that is with air pollution. So we have standards um, set by the Clean Air Act uh, in the National Ambient Air Quality Standards. We have six criteria air pollutants that are monitored regionally and we have to stay below a certain level to keep our public safety. And PM 2.5, so that means particulate matter, uh, smaller than 2.5 microns in diameter. So that's air pollution particles that are roughly one fourth of the diameter of a grain of human hair. So that's how small they are. So we know that PM 2.5 particles, when they enter um, our bodies via inhalation, can travel into our respiratory tract and can cause a lot of problems. And so that's why we, and there's a very strong body of evidence that has proven that, and that's why we regulate PM2.5. But there are other air pollutant sources which lead um, to PM, like that would be considered um, almost like nano, nanoparticles, like even smaller, even finer particulate matter. We oftentimes will call them ultra fine particulates. And so those are particles that are even smaller. So what science would tell us. What would be is, an example of, of, of one of those, Lindsay? Of an ultra fine particle? Yeah. So it might be something that was generated more by like an aerosol, say, than dust. So if like dust okay. led to 2.5, say like an aerosol led to an ultra fine particle. And so what science would tell us is that the smaller the particle, the more dangerous to our respiratory system because 
if PM 2.5, say for example, could go two thirds of the way down into our respiratory tract, ultrafine particles are gonna go even further and they're going to enter our bloodstream and they're going to disrupt the homeostasis of our bodies, which means the way our bodies are, are supposed to accurately work, say. So- And if, would, they, would they be small enough to pass the blood brain barrier? Absolutely, yep. And so that's what's what's troublesome is that we as as a as a body of, of people as a government um we're we're saying oh well, we don't uh we don't need to set a standard for ultrafine particles because there isn't this huge body of literature like there is for PM2.5. But common sense would tell us that ultrafine particles are more dangerous. So that's something that's kind of um really I think huge flaw of the way we handle environmental regulation in our country is now the impetus is on scientists to show a body of work that shows the danger of ultrafine particles when really we should just say, hey, we know the smaller ones are even far far more dangerous. We don't need 30 years of millions of dollars of immunologic study. We just do it all. <laughs> now, this, this would be the concern with the wildfire smoke too as well, right? Because it isn't that high in that particular matter that you're talking about? Yes, yes. So with the wildfires, we see really high levels of PM 2.5, um, probably some of the highest our country has seen in the modern era. Um, it's really crazy as a scientist who studies these things on the global scale to see concentrations of this magnitude in the United States is just it's really, I mean, Within my career, it's certainly unprecedented, and I know a lot of my colleagues would say the same. It's just unbelievable that that we have these kind of exposures happening in the United States. Um, one day, I think last week we surpassed um, development developing areas of India as having some of the worst air quality in the on the entire planet. And I think wow. what's really I'm no expert in wildfires, but I think what's very scary to me about the smoke generated from these fires is we know what's in wildfire smoke when it's just the burning of forest biomass, when it's just trees and the detritus on the bottom of the forest floor. We know sort of what those compounds are like in that smoke. But when we see the burning of refrigerators, automobiles, Cool covers, anything in these people's in built environments, and, you know, gasoline, all sorts of stuff that was burning up in these fires. What does that mean for what's in that smoke? That really, that is a great point. And, and I didn't even think about that until just this very second, but it makes right. perfect sense. And it really is scary because, you know, there's so many regulation a lot of a lot of chemicals that are coming from industry or waste that's coming from industry that you'd think of as hazardous waste, a, a very um, applicable solution to getting rid of those is incineration. So under very tightly controlled um, facilities, hazardous waste can be burned, but they have an a, a unimaginable amount of of air quality that they um, control measures that they have to go through to be able to to do that. And they have to capture, you know, whatever that is being burned, they have to capture all of that and make sure that nothing gets into the atmosphere. But you're, you're essentially doing you're, you're, you, what you're doing in a wildfire is burning hazardous waste. If you, if you were talking about a, an industrial um, company, corporation process that would be burning <laughs> plastic, be burning um, paint thinner, gasoline, just straight into the atmosphere. I mean, that would be, people would just lose their minds, but it's so seldom talked about when you're talking about a wildfire. It's a great point to bring up. What is that doing to yeah. the immediate environment? In, from a research perspective, these are huge challenges that we're facing, and we need to try to adapt our research strategies to be able to better study these extreme events and what is happening in the immediate days following these extreme events. And that's not just the case for wildfires, but for hurricanes, for extreme flooding. Like with Hurricane Harvey in Texas, we saw you know, that there was just all sorts of contaminants in the floodwaters, um, E. coli, septic systems that were overflowing into the floodwaters that entered people's homes. In 
Puerto Rico, Hurricane Maria. Um, what's interesting about that is that uh, Puerto Rico has the highest concentration of super stuff. And so all sorts of you know, dangers that disrupted the environment in Puerto Rico could have led to exposures to super fun chemicals to people who were nearby. But the way we do this, this scientific research is we're not very good at like on the ground response because in part, the way our research works is that we need to have grants that can prescribe. And, and so we don't have the resources to immediately respond and get there with things. So the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences is one federal group that's actually trying to create grant mechanisms for responding earlier. But another challenge is these situations are creating such a dire set of circumstances that the priority right now is not research. The priority in Woolsey and campfires this week is not research into what is in the smoke. It's, it's you know, recovering bodies and getting people who are survivors situated. Right. And I think, um, how, how do you study this? I mean, re I mean, really, I mean, because it's not like you can take a, a, a control group and <laughs> then a, a human subject and do a, a, a study where you can expose one group of people to a certain burned chemical and not the other group. I mean, how, how do we study this? So there's a lot of different techniques in epidemiology that we use. Um, I'll give you guys some examples from my own work. So like one example that we use is a cohort study. So in a cohort study, you enroll people with mixed exposures and you follow them over time to see what kind of outcomes they end up with. So you know that this neighborhood has a history of different exposures. You enroll the uh, residents of the neighborhood, and then you follow them prospectively to see what kind of outcomes they come up with. That's a common prospective cohort study. Another um, type of study we use is a case control study. So in a case control study, you have people who already have an outcome. So for example, you have moms who have sadly experienced a stillbirth, and then you have a control group of mob moms who delivered a healthy pregnancy and delivered a baby. And we can look uh, historically back at what exposures the case group had that the, that the uh, uh, control group didn't have. So that's another technique we use. In my work with the um, uh, heat and pregnancy, I use um, an adaptation of the case control study called the case crossover, um, which is a somewhat complex study design that is designed to mimic a randomized control trial. So this is what you would be talking about. Like we couldn't purposefully expose someone to uh, wildfire smoke. That, that would be completely unethical. We would never do that. So we can't take advantage of what, of what would be a randomized control trial. So we try to mimic it using a case crossover design. So like in my work, I'm looking at data on their temperature and air pollution exposures that they experienced right before they had a preterm birth. And then I'm, ex I'm comparing that to other periods close by in the pregnancy, which did not result in a preterm birth to see how the exposures differed. So I'm sort of trying to mimic the randomized design by just using one individual woman who had an adverse outcome. It's now, a little bit tricky to understand. What I can't help but to think in, in this is what what makes a study conclusive? Because if, if you had, let's say, a hundred different people that you were doing these studies on or you had in the um as controls um what i mean who's to say that one of them you know wasn't didn't have a terrible diet or one of them never worked out or one of them was obese and the other one wasn't it seems like there's so many factors that you wouldn't be able to tell ever be able to point yes, the finger at AJ, one specific aj you are really thinking like an epidemiologist i love this question um so the phenomena that you're talking about is actually, we have a term for it. So we call it confounding. Um, okay. And that's when like an independent third variable confounds the relationship. And I think a really good example of this would be a study that was published a few years back saying that 
um, coffee drinking led to lung cancer. And I think it even ended up like in the Times or something because they were able to find this really strong association in their study where the more cups of coffee you drank, the greater your risk of lung cancer. What else do coffee drinkers do? Smoke. There's probably smoking every time <laughs> that they're drinking coffee. <laughs> exactly. So in that case, it was actually coffee drinking that was confounding the relationship between um, cigarette smoke and lung cancer, which we know is the true relationship there. And so we take great measures to identify when you're looking at an exposure and a disease, what could potential confounders be? Quality of the diet, like you said, education, oftentimes um, social characteristics like income and things like that have a huge impact on the relationship between an exposure and the disease. And so when we design our studies, we try to collect information on all of those third independent factors, those confounders. And then um, we can adjust for them using statistical modeling to sort of use a statistical model to sparse out the impact of those third variables and really capture the true association between exposure and disease. Nice. AJ, excellent yeah. question, buddy. Yeah, are you impressed, Bryce? I got a lot of AJ, good questions coming. You no, underestimated no, your value in this conversation. <laughs> yeah, you did. You did. Not bad Don't sell for yourself short, buddy. Kid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I find this all uh, really interesting. Um, it, and it, it does spark questions like that. And I know I, I listen to – I'm guilty of listening to Joe Rogan a lot, not to plug him again. But um, same. <laughs> he – there was just something on the other day that had – and you, you'll you continue these terms that I can't remember the name of, but where there was another variable that was factoring into the thing, into whatever whatever it was, just like the drinking coffee and smoking cigarettes. It just seems like it would be so difficult in so many variables to be able to actually make inclusive – I would imagine we, that like that's the why larger – don't... We definitely steer steer clear of saying it's conclusive. <laughs> um, you know, we we really try to emphasize that these are associations that we observed or correlation. We'll sometimes say, but epidemiology can't really capture causation. Like we would like to. So, what's your goal? So, what's Lindsay, your goal? Then? Like, what you know, like, what's your end goal in all of it? So, if you're doing a study like that. Do you understand the question? Like, what what would be the ultimate best case scenario? Well, that definitely depends on the context of the study. But our goal, I would say, is to do a really, really good job. We want to have really good um, internal validity. So we want to accurately characterize the uh, true quantitative relationship between the exposure. Hey, and the AJ, disease. AJ, if you're going to... um. If you're gonna get water, oh, you sorry, your bike. sorry, <laughs> <laughs> guys. But maybe also pull it away from your face a little bit because you got a little loud there. Um, <laughs> I'm not gonna lie to you guys. I've had a severe Charlie horse in my leg for the past <laughs> three minutes, and so I'm trying to put some scratch in my water so I can get some electrolytes in me because I like I've been seizing up over here and I'm trying to hold it in. <laughs> but continue. <laughs> I'll I'll mute next time. Um... <laughs> Okay. So, um, yeah, I think we want internal validity. We want to make sure that we're doing the best we can to quantify the exposure and the disease, um, even in the presence of these confounding factors. We want external validity, which means we want to make sure that the associations we're studying are generalizable um, to large groups of the population. But I think if you do a really good job conducting a study and we identify an association between an exposure and a disease, even though we can't technically say that that's conclusive, um, we can put that into the scientific literature and you have all of these other studies who looked at it in a similar way in studies that had different strengths and limitations than our own. And the end goal is to sort of contribute knowledge to the scientific literature and then have that literature be turned around by policymakers um, for policies that are more health protective whether or not that process is actually working right now is certainly grounds for debate, um, but that's probably for another podcast. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, 
I would I, I want to come back to the studies for a second because I, a question of mine that I'm genuinely curious about is you'd think I mean it, the scientific method would suggest that you would want the largest possible sample size mm -hmm. but does that does that help or complicate things for you it, it, you're it seems like you're in a kind of a niche um, research area where you maybe too large of a sample size might uh, create some sort of an erroneous result? Can mm -hmm. you speak to that? Yeah, so that's a really good question. So it definitely depends on the context of the study, sort of like what resources do you have? Um, what's the timing of the study that you'd like to have? But I think you have to definitely balance, like with a very large sample size, you don't have the resources to gather as much information from your individual participants as you would with a smaller sample size, obviously. So based on what your scientific question is, you really have to balance what is the appropriate sample size. So one of the first things we do is we conduct sample size power calculations, which are just statistical calculations that say, okay, if we think the associate, like you sort of are making a guess at what you think the strength of the association is, which is informed by previous studies usually. Um, and you say, okay, if I want to detect an association this strong, um, how many people do I need um, to enroll in the study to have the statistical precision to do that? And so we have calculations we use to tell us that. And I think it also depends, like I said, it's very highly variable depending on your research question. So. In my study, we're looking at women across the entire United States, and that's great because nobody has ever done that before. Nobody has ever asked this question looking at the whole U.S. population. But that means like I don't know very much about my individual participants because all I have is the fetal death record or the birth certificate information, and I don't even have the entire thing. Um, I only have the relevant health information. Um, for my study, I don't have further information about the mom or any identifying characteristics or anything. Um, I'm going to put you on the spot for a second, if mm -hmm. you don't mind. Sure. Because this is this is so important, um, and it has such an impact on everybody. But we're in an interesting time for science right now, mm -hmm. and. And we're at the point where, I mean, I, I genuinely, genuinely cannot understand why the flat earth thing is even a thing. <laughs> like, uh, we're not going to go there. But <laughs> it's, it's, my question for you is, how do we convince people? How do you convince people? I mean, that's got to be, that's got to be one of, one of your biggest challenges is taking your research and, and getting it digestible for people so that they can have something that they can make a substantive change in their own life, right? Yeah, it's a really, really good question. Uh, the first step is to uh, participate in podcasts of motocross stars to get all this information to the <laughs> yep. general public. <laughs> right. So, uh, so one of, obviously it, to to spread the word is is important, right? Yeah, to spread the word is definitely important. To simplify important, it, though. Absolutely. Simplifying it is a huge part of it. Um, getting those scientific um, facts like down for the lay person to, to speak to the public in a way that's approachable, that's really important. And all scientists need to improve our ability to do that. Um, I think it can be a little bit frustrating, like for me being in climate change research, I, I think I'm getting to a point where somebody will say to me, okay, well, um, let's like do some studies to show that climate change is impacting health. And it's like, well, God damn it. When do we get to stop quantifying that and start doing something about it? At what point is the evidence strong enough that we can start taking right. some serious action here? And so that's frustrating for me. Um, but I think that, um, one of the things, particularly with climate change related exposures, is to help people to understand that these things are happening now. Um, we no longer have the privilege to say, 
in 20 years, our grandchildren may encounter wildfires or hurricanes. Um, we also, you know, it's not about polar bears. I think one of the biggest mistakes we've made from a climate change communication um, uh, regard is to say, to focus on polar bears and the North Pole, because that's not gonna change people's behaviors. Knowing that this has serious implications right now, today, for the storms that we're gonna experience this winter, that's really important to get people to understand that. It, right, and, and to, to go on top of that, it's, it's God forbid it snows in the Northeast ever in winter. Because that's when the climate deniers go full bore. Oh, <laughs> if the global warming, how could it possibly be snowing? Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you always have to remember to just remind those folks that that's not climate, it's weather. And there's a difference between climate and weather. Um, and so, you know, it's, for example, like cold spells or huge snowstorms, like 10 feet of snow dropping on Boston and, and people saying, oh, we need some more global warming. This is terrible. People need to understand that those extreme events are a result of a changing climate. For example, with precipitation, a warmer atmosphere like the one that we've created has a better ability to hold on to moisture. So that makes precipitation events uh, more intense. Additionally, um, because we have a warmer atmosphere now, we now have a much slower moving jet stream. It's, it's like you can think of it as a lazy jet stream. So when a weather pattern, like say a hurricane gale force winds with precipitation would previously move quickly over Houston, Texas, and it would be in and out within a six hour period. Now with our lazy jet stream, a weather pattern or a storm system has the ability to linger much longer over space, which is what's one of the things that's contributing to these like four days of hurricane precipitation and things like that. So, so those things are related to a changing climate. And it's really important to remind people that when it snows in Glastonbury, Connecticut, that's weather. <laughs> right. But how do we convince people? I, I, I think we, that's that's the question that I wrestle with. Like, it can Is there hope? Is there hope, Lindsay? <laughs> um, I think that there is definitely hope. Um, I think that a lot of those sort of climate change deniers, if you will call them for lack of a better term, they're going to eventually become an extinct species. <laughs> And I think that there is a loud voice in our generation of people, irregardless of their political um, ideologies that are saying, okay, well, you know, this is happening, it's here. I think even if for some reason, you don't think that human emissions generated a changing climate, you do, you can see that, for example, I think it's like the past, uh, this is an estimate of the fact because I can't remember the exact fact, but I think it's like the past 16 hottest years ever recorded since the beginning of meteorology have been recorded in the past like 18 years. So whether or not you believe in human caused climate change, it's getting hotter. And increase in heat is worsening wildfires. So whatever your political ideologies are, you can see that it's getting hotter and you can see that heat makes wildfires worse because it extends the wildfire season it makes the fires more intense etc so you know these things are here so in terms of convincing people it's like well go outside right now let me say this and i could be way off base but i can speak for at least myself on this one i think what with what kind of put it this way for a lot of people it, it came on with like al gore and all of that is in my mind where I first heard the term global warming was Al Gore mm -hmm. and all of that. So I related. You, you're, you're referring to an inconvenient truth. Right. I think so. But all, so what that did in my mind is all it did was make that political and I wrote it off. 
So yeah. I thought, oh, that's politics. That's that's a bunch of BS. And I didn't think it was legitimate. Or who knows if what he said was legitimate or not. I, I don't even know. I don't know what he said. Do, so you so you basically just you you saw the messenger and be, because yes. the messenger was a political figure that contributed to you um, not giving it as much credibility as you would have had it not come from a person who had been in politics. Yeah, that's a good yeah. way to. So, yeah, AJ, you are really not alone in that feeling. Um, that's actually been something that has been discussed as one of the drivers of what we would call the politicization of climate change was Al Gore's role, which is, it's very unfortunate because Al Gore has done great things for climate change communication. His documentaries are factual, they're straight to the point. Um, I think he, he's really amplified the message. He's brought this to the attention of a lot of people and he's done very good work. You know, unfortunately he had a platform because he was a politician and that has contributed to some people saying, hey, the, the environment um, is, a, is a democratic thing. It's, it's not a Republican issue, but we all live in the same planet. We all live on the same earth. We're all experiencing the same threats of climate change. It's not a political issue. And I think one way that we'll start to move away from that politicization is that places that are historically very red politically are experiencing horrible impacts from climate change and so i think right. by necessity they're going to have to change some of their views and they're going to have to do it pretty quick well that's yeah and and i think sorry AJ, what i was going to say was like it's funny how globalization works because we live in such a well-connected world now and there are so few barriers that connect the world other than the physical ones, which we've done a really great job of overcoming. But yet we, it's, it would seem that we do such a poor job of applying the rest of the world's logic to within our country, right? And, and specifically with regard to climate change, I mean, we, we're, what other country is so adamantly in denial of it or, or has taken the stance that AJ laid out, which I think is perfectly reasonable. I mean, to to the average person, I think that's a perfectly reasonable thing to to make the assumption about. Hey, look, it came from Al Gore. He's a political figure. He was vice president, Democratic president. This is political. Like that that seems reasonable to me. That's and I hadn't really thought about that up until you said that, AJ. Which I'm glad you brought that up. But you, all you have to really do is look outside the U.S. This isn't a political thing. This is a human thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's too but, why platforms like this, granted we just started, but platforms like Joe Rogan and like these everyday people that aren't scientists, they're just, you know, like I'm just a motocross racer. Right. But I think we get across to the everyday people, which ultimately that's that's what you need to do. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um it it's it's really a a huge challenge with how polarized our political conversation has become and i try to really make a concerted effort uh to not be too much of a zealot in either direction um i am comfortable with saying that you know in in some uh, in some ways informed by my career um that i i'm a scientist that i'm a female scientist i'm an environmental scientist a lot of that informs my political ideologies, um, which are probably pretty blue on the spectrum of our audience. But I also appreciate a lot of uh, Republican uh, economic ideas. And so I, I I don't think I'm too much of a, of a zealot in either direction. I, I appreciate capitalism. I appreciate the gains it's brought to our country. I appreciate people who hope that hardworking Americans in the United States would have a little bit lower federal tax burden. I appreciate all of those things. Um, but when it comes to the environment, we really need to come together um, on issues of both the environment and healthcare. We really need to find a way to meet in the middle. The polarization isn't helping anybody. Well, that's very true. Um, I have another question. 
Go ahead. <laughs> well, not really a question. Um, I was reading an article or one of the studies that you you did. I, I don't know if it was maybe on campus. Did you ask a bunch of students this one question regarding weather events that concern you the most? Uh, so actually, we we conducted that study all around Boston. Um, so what okay. we did is we went to MBTA, um, which is the public transit system in Boston in Massachusetts. We went to uh, train stops. Uh, we selected the five stops based on areas of the city that would have different vulnerabilities to climate change, but would also have different social demographics. And so we went around to people who were getting uh, on and off the train, and we just asked them for a second to, to try to capture some of the city's opinions about climate change. And what was the questions that you asked? Uh, so we asked a series of questions. Um, we tried to sort of gauge um, what was people's level of concern. So we asked them if they thought climate change was an economic threat to Boston. We asked them if they thought it was a health threat to the people of Boston. Uh, we asked them where they get their climate change information. So was that the television news? Was that Twitter, uh, social media, friends, newspapers? Um, we asked them if they thought uh, the city of Boston should be doing more than they are to address climate change, and, and they are doing a lot. And uh, it was the results were really, really interesting. And and the question you're referring to, we asked them which of these extreme events concerns them the most. AJ, mute your mic, please. Uh, <laughs> that's Allie. She's watering the Christmas tree. <laughs> oh, uh, it's Christmas time. Allie, uh, stop, stop watering yet. the Christmas tree. <laughs> No, yeah. you gotta water that thing. You don't want it to, you know. I just watered it. I'm. It is. I'm a, proud of you for having a real tree. It's like, what a what an it's homage a Griswold to the tree. We have 13 foot ceilings, and it's touching the ceiling. But hey, can you wow. ask Bryce That's that? Awesome. Can you ask Bryce that question? Because I'm curious as to what Bryce's answer would be. Yeah, so we asked people which of these events concerns you the most, and the options to choose from were. A blizzard, a heat wave, a hurricane, a flood, or a prolonged, prolonged drought. And we asked them which concerns you the most. And what's your answer, Bryce? They're all bad. <laughs> <They're>, <laughs> um, I'm. So, what are the options again? Uh, a blizzard, a hurricane, a heat wave, a drought, or a flood. I would say, although they're completely opposite, I would have to choose between drought and flood. Um, and I, I would venture to say drought. I, I think drought would be the, the, the scariest for me because you can, you can overcome a blizzard very mm -hmm. pretty quickly. You could cripple a city, you can overcome it. Mm -hmm. um, my concern with a flood is that it could uh, have an effect on the – sanitary sewer system yeah. the the drinking water system but that can all be overcome you could find different routes for it mm -hmm. route scares me because water is not at least in the way we consume it now is not limitless right. and and man I mean, all you have to do is take a look at any country facing a water crisis and see the conditions there or go to flint michigan in the united states and see the water crisis there and understand how difficult life is without drinking water or water that you can consume, it, whether it be in your body or in a shower or whatever, or in cooking. I mean, that that probably is the most terrifying for me. Yeah, that's a really good answer. I'm very impressed with the thoughtfulness of that answer. Um, for me- I try. <laughs> uh, I'm not just saying this because I'm a heat researcher, but for me, um, it's obvious that heat wave would be my biggest concern. And that's because if you just look at the facts in terms of the number of people who die regularly as a result of these exposures, it's heat. Heat really kills people. Um, and so for me, it was kind of obvious that it was heat. And I was really surprised by the fact that very few people were concerned about heat wave. In Boston, over a third of respondents said it was flood that concern them the most. And I think that's in large part because of what you mentioned, Bryce, with sanitation, like flood really has the ability to completely wreck infrastructure. 
Do you think that's why but people also, are I'm, answering I'm wondering... that as flood, or do you think people were just afraid of a flood? I think well, that's it, part of the reason. Hold that... on, Lindsay. Bef before you answer that, I want to kind of give my hypothesis, and then I want to hear yours. Okay. <laughs> I have a hypothesis. My thought is this. Too. So I I'm thinking flood be that they people chose flood because it's the most immediate thing that people can experience with their own eyes. Yeah. That's that that is above and beyond the devastation that they would experience anywhere else. Like they they can. It, it, what did it? Did you guys just flood in Boston? Was it last year? Would they have a bad flooding? <laughs> yeah. So it's like a. It was current. B. It's something that they that they can visually see and understand the impact of immediately. Snow is cool. There's a novelty of it. Like yes, a blizzard is not great, but then you get to go outside and play in the snow, and you get to stay home from work, and like they don't. That I could see is not being a choice. Flooding, the heat on the same token. Your summer, that's beach time. Like mm -hmm. there's things that are that are um, associated with heat that are very positive. Mm -hmm. Like you could drink, you could go to a bar outside <laughs> and celebrate on the rooftops and be in bathing suits and go to rooftop pool parties and like that. So like the the people who are least vulnerable would see that as not a a, a big thing. Like I think flooding makes everybody vulnerable. Absolutely. Everybody's vulnerable to a flood. Absolutely. And I can share the link to the article, um, but as you mentioned, people can see flooding. And one of the uh, nuances of our conclusions in that was that the sampling that we conducted was last March 2018, which was when we actually experienced um, an unprecedented uh, amount of nor'easters. They happened like three or four nor'easters within like a three-week period. And so we had had this unbelievable flooding and a lot of it was visually captured on television um, right here where I live in the seaport of Boston. It was crazy. Like there was a video of dumpsters, like just floating through main streets of Boston, um, cars being um, overtook by the water. So I think that visual element, you can see your neighborhood flooding. You can't see your less vulnerable neighbors dying in a heat wave. So that visual element, I think, is probably what drives the concern about floods. Hmm. I find this interesting because I would I would have said flood. My first response would have been flood because I'm just afraid of open water, and like I feel like drowning is one of my worst fears. But then if I sat there and actually thought about it, I would have chose drought. Yeah. Just like Bryce. Like Bryce yeah, Bryce, like Bryce mentioned, a lot a lot of um so climate change and its impact literally touches every single part of our society. And and a, what a lot of people don't realize is that it's a national security issue. It's it's really an international conflict issue. Um when you look at places like Yemen and Syria. These are water wars, and I'm not sure why that has been really lost in the mainstream media, but what a lot of people don't understand is conflicts like that started with droughts, which are related to climate change. And so, you know, and what, what would be better for the United States than if all of our energy was generated on our own soils from renewable sources? What better thing for our national security? Um, and I think that we need to make sure that's part of the conversation that, you know, Syria, a lot of the mutiny of the government was because farmers had experienced these horrible droughts and they weren't pleased with the things the government had done to help them. And so, you know, it all started with a drought. And, and for some reason, that whole narrative of like the impact of climate change on international conflicts seems to be lost in the mainstream media. And I think it's one of the ways that we can effectively get at um, our, our neighbors who are a little bit more red on the political spectrum, who are very motivated by national security. Uh, this is one way we can link up with them to help them understand the need for climate action. Now, out of curiosity, what was the source in which they said they were getting this information from? What, what was the winner of that? Oh, um, most people got their information from the television. 
they said, but that was followed very closely by social media, which was a little bit alarming to us because we know that there's a lot of information on social media that's incorrect. Right. Um, and then uh, another thing that was But there's also a lot of information on TV that's incorrect, <laughs> depending on which that's true too, station absolutely. you're watching. Depending on what you're watching, absolutely. And um, another thing that was interesting, we asked people how often they were hearing about climate change on the news. Um, and I think the majority of people said, said like once a month or less, which is super alarming hmm. to us. That's interesting. I, I know, yeah. again, speaking for myself, I don't watch TV. Everything that I would know is coming from, this is scary to say, but I would say 90% of it would come from YouTube. When there's an event that happens, um, if there's yeah. a shooting or the fire, all of it, I always, it, it'll just yeah. pop up on my YouTube and I'll just watch it on there. Right. And I think um, this sort of issue of where are people getting their information is really important, not just for science and climate change, but for our entire national discourse. I mean, I would say one place that I go to um, when I want to hear about something that's going on is I go to Twitter. I, I think of my Twitter feed as basically like my informational news feed. That's where I get a lot of my news. But the thing that's dangerous about that is my the people who I follow on Twitter are a highly curated group of scientists, academics. And so I'm really only getting one side if I'm using Twitter as my source of news. And so it's really important that we um, look at other sources so we can get a more balanced. Um, um, one side is in, would, would these scientists not be posting objective thoughts? They're, they're posting um, their opinions on things? I think that they are posting objective thoughts, but only sort of um, on one side of the argument. There can be an objectivity that's correct on both sides of an argument. And I think um, the information that I'm seeing is, is definitely um, coming from a certain lens and it's important to think about that lens and be aware of it that's actually that kind of is a good segue into into another topic i want to get to Lindsay, and that's how do you how do you li limit or eliminate like personal biases out of the research you're doing um and not to say that you have any mm -hmm. but like it, it, you are you, in your team is, is that something that you guys are cognizant of of any uh, biases that you have and of course in the scientific method you want to try to eliminate all, all that stuff and get as an objective as a result as you possibly can but how do you what's your process in in kind of eliminating your own bias out of out of your research absolutely so um this is a very hot topic right now in science which is where is the line between advocate and scientist because a scientist is supposed to be completely objective on the issue that they're studying. And so there is sort of an older school of thought, I would say, where scientists were supposed to be people who just did their objective research and they didn't even care about communication or policies because it was somebody else's job to pick up the science and the scientific literature and turn it into policy. Um, or, you know, scientists, I think, uh, historically have been less likely to engage in public discourse or, or advocacy. I think what you have to be careful to do is to differentiate your advocacy from the type of work that you're doing. So for example, I definitely identify as a climate change advocate, and I'm not afraid to say that. I can hear some of my professors who are like in their 60s cringing in the corner over my saying that, but I'm not afraid to identify that way. I am not um, standing outside with a sandwich board on my soapbox saying uh, heat causes preterm births, heat causes preterm births. That's not what I'm doing. I'm advocating for smarter climate policies, which is totally different than what I'm actually studying. So I, you make that sort of distinction there. So I think that um, there's a lot of reasons why I'm comfortable being an advocate. One is that the um, body of literature, the scientific understanding that humans have 
contributed to climate change and we are facing dangers from climate change is so strong. The scientific consensus on that is stronger than the scientific consensus that cigarette smoking causes lung cancer. So for one, the scientific consensus is very strong. Second, we- That's a great perspective to put that in. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, That's awesome. No problem. So secondly, um, we are in really dire circumstances. We really need action and we really need better policies on that. And probably I would say we are in more dire circumstances in terms of the quality of our environment than we've been in in the modern age. And so, you know, we don't really have time to mess around here. And so I think that I can be an advocate for, say, carbon reducing energy strategies, um, policies to reduce particulate matter for asthmatic children. I can be an advocate for all of that and still do sound, objective epidemiology on whether or not heat causes pregnancy adverse events. And furthermore, I think it's really important to say that if my study finds null results or even protective results, like you said, if my study says that a little bit fewer degrees warmer, kept the baby nice and warm in the oven and you wanted to stay in there a little longer in preterm births where it did not result from higher temperatures, that's still really important for the scientific understanding. It's still really important for the scientific literature that I put those results out there. So I, I have a hypothesis about what's going to happen in my dissertation, but no matter what happens, I'll put that out there in the scientific literature and I'll stand by it, regardless of how I feel as a climate change. Perfect. And what is your hypothesis? Uh, so my hypothesis is that warmer temperatures are going to cause a slight increase in the adverse events and that it's likely um, going to be related to perhaps dehydration or some pathological event that happens in the mom um, as a result of her being really, really hot. Interesting. Oh, I thought I was muted there. Um, we're exactly 70 minutes in. Is, uh, is there anything else you Not guys want to Not counting the, addi the additional 24 that I have to edit. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. So then perfect. Yeah. Um, well, then I think now is as good a time as any to say thank you very much to Lindsay again for joining us on this episode. I, this was really informative and I, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you, Lindsay. I think that this is exactly what we're going for with this podcast. And hopefully for our listeners, my questions made sense of it maybe a little bit more. <laughs> um, but I, I definitely I definitely learned a lot. And that's the whole idea of this podcast. So thank you for coming on and joining Thanks. us. I hope your audience um, can take away a little something. And uh, I uh, am always happy to talk to members of the public about some of these really important issues that I have the privilege of studying. Awesome. AJ, uh, AJ, Lindsay, before we let you go, is there any sign off that you want to give or is there any, like if, if they were, if there was one takeaway from this episode and anything that you said or anything that you're working on, what would that be? Hmm. Um, I think at the risk of sounding corny, I would say that it, um, that it is that this is actually a very hopeful situation, that we have an enormous opportunity to respond to our changing climate with solutions that can make everyone's lives better and safer. Um, we can respond with jobs, uh, we can respond with innovation. And so I think this conversation has gotten really dark and people are really pessimistic and to some people, they are pessimistic to the point of apathy, which is like, this. Is, we are in such a bad, sucky situation. Like, there's nothing we can do, so why even try? That's not the case. This is a time of great opportunity, and um, you know, this could be a, a real revolution for our country and for the entire world to really step up to this challenge. So it is hopeful. It's not all dark would be the main takeaway. There is hope, people. Perfect. Don't be ignorant, but be positive. 
I love it. Drink lots of water, which AJ and I will talk about ad nauseum. Um, eat your vegetables, right? Yeah. Broccoli, like, um, you know, it's it's funny. I don't know if you follow Rhonda Patrick at all. Are you familiar with it? Uh, with her she's i would look into her if i were you she's awesome and and to all of our listeners Rhonda patrick super cool um but she has a lot of research that um like things that contain uh sulforaphane so like cruciferous vegetables broccoli mm -hmm. cauliflower broccoli sprouts they they those compounds break down toxins in your body at like an unprecedented level it's so cool yeah, it's great um, to get some so antioxidants in because the mechanism by which a lot of these things cause adverse events in the body is by oxidative stress. So get those antioxidants in for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yep, me and AJ, we talk about it all the time. Eat your vegetables, eat real food, drink lots of water. Yeah. And uh, for, for God's sakes, people, just use a reusable water bottle. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually good about that. I'm drinking out of one as we speak. Me too. But hey, Lindsay, thank you again. And uh, thank you to our listeners. And thank you to, uh, we don't even have a sponsor for this, for this podcast. We don't need one. We don't need yeah, one. We don't. We're that official now. We fund ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> Heck yeah. This, this episode is sponsored by my Christmas tree. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Thanks again, right. Lindsay. Thank it you was guys. a pleasure. Bye -bye. Hey, when are you officially done with your PhD, by the way? Oh, man, that's a really, that's a million dollar question. I think the answer is that it's going to be longer than I'd hope. <laughs> well, we wish you the best of luck. Thanks so much. Thanks, guys. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.